In, to, in this last lesson, we're going to talk about First Second and Third John, as well as Revelation. Um, really, Revelation you could spend a long time on, especially in light of so many people today who misunderstand Revelation, misuse Revelation, or some other thing like that. Um, yeah. Starting with First Second and Third John, the author is John, the elder of Ephesus, the um, the one of the twelve. Um, he died of old age. Um, by tradition, he was persecuted many times, but they were unable to kill him. Um, and so he was sent to Pat the island of Patmos, and eventually he died of old age. Um, <clears throat> so the audience um, in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is... In 1st John, it's the church of Ephesus. In 2nd John, it's a, it's a specific house church. And in 3rd John, it's Gaius, one person. Okay? Um, so, um, the first thing in third John dates somewhere around uh, late '80s, early '90s, somewhere um, in there. Um, the context: Ephesus is troubled by false teachings, and we potentially see a, a degrading factor. Um, I don't know if degrading is the right word. Um, degenerating condition, um, like here, right here, developing problems. It seems like. There's false teachers dividing the church in the first one, but then you know they're out, and then but then by the second, John, by second John, false teachers are attacking church from the outside. So maybe like they're trying to get back in, or they're trying to you know reassert power. And then in third John, maybe leadership is in uh, leadership is in church leadership in church in the church is false. Maybe it might be a, a, if they're if they're in chronological order, it might be a, a gradual. Um, um, Degeneration, especially in light that in Revelations um, they have become stagnant. So, kind of possibility. Um, don't push this too far. But if that is the case, I mean, John did a lot to keep it from going wrong, and in the end, there wasn't anything that he could have done. See what I mean? Sometimes, as a minister, uh, the, I get this straight from from Pentecost to Patmos. As a minister, you you do the the best you can, but ultimately it's 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 God who does the work. God who does. Remember, we we may water, we may plant, but it's God that causes the increase. Okay, so but once again, there's obviously no definitive proof that it is in chronological order or that it is um, degeneration. Maybe it's just a, a, a bunch of different uh, problems that came up. We don't know. But whatever it is, um, Ephesus is really a central um, place, and is uh, a lot of the Bible goes to Ephesus, Acts, um, Ephesians potentially, potentially, uh, First Timothy. Uh, first Saint and Third John, Revelations is mentioned. See what I mean? Ephesus really seems like a really seems like a key place. So, um, <clears throat> so possibly possible degeneration of the issue. Um, now, if you compare John with First John, the Gospel of John with the Epistle of First John, you really come to a very a very balanced theology of God. In John, um, it, it, he mentions. Christ deity, but in the in First John he emphasizes his humanity. He was fully human, but then in John he was fully God. Well, which one? Yes. Um, in, in in John we have um, empowering believers to keep commands, but in First John we have reminder against claims of sinlessness. See the see the contrast there. First John is hey you're not sinless, but then in 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 John we have believers being empowered to keep the commands so very interesting there in John we have eternal life death life or death beginning now this is something that you are in first John he emphasizes it as coming in the future and this is um, and I know you guys have probably heard people say um, already and not yet we are saved but we're not yet saved in the sense that we haven't been given our resurrected bodies you know um, once again with that um, uh, I because one there's something else I was gonna say about that um, so John kind of emphasizes in the more um, here and now aspect of it first John emphasizes in the, the more um, end of the road aspect 
Because you can be saved and then abandon it, and you can also not be saved and think that you're saved and then later come to um, repent to true repentance. Um, in John we have we have the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but in First John we have he, he says test the spirits. So here we have just just this real contrast. And it's not just Christology that, that has its comparison here. As you can see, it's it's a lot of different things, uh, church function and and, and and pneumatology too. Um, so about the false teachings of verse John, um, they had the claim of sinless perfection. Okay, we have attained perfection, but in, but in John, First John, he says, keep the commands. They have the claim, um, and, well, not the claim, but they were acting as lawless. So John says, keep the commands and love. Um, they um, said that Christ only appeared as human. He says Christ is fully human. They said spirit descended on, on Christ at baptism and left at crucifixion. Christ came as water and blood. So, the main theme of really the whole first thing and third John is the tests of life. Um, he a lot of times John will say something and he's not saying necessarily like okay I'll give you an example. Um, he'll say like the righteous don't sin. He doesn't mean that they never sin. He's saying they don't live in sin. So he's more talking about the way that there's evidence of life and there's evidence of death, not so much the fact of perfectionism, um, which is funny because that's actually what he's combating. First John uh, one eight. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. For those for those who who claim that there's a, there's a moment after salvation when you um, become perfect, wrong. I haven't committed sin sin, sin, sin since. No, you're wrong. Um, in 2.22, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Now, some people would say, yes, he was an Messiah or an, a Christ. Here's the thing. Christ, by definition, is singular, a one-time thing. So for there to be multiple ones, like for instance, maybe the Baha'i would say, it's completely nonsense. In 3.6, um, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And the NIV kind of does it for you, but basically what he's saying is living in sin versus sinning on occasion. There is a difference. We, we are people, and so we will sin until the resurrection. This is where Jehovah's Witness get it wrong. They say that after this, remember, there's 144,000 that will live as spirits in heaven, but then the rest are going to live on earth, right? But then, um, you know, for the millennium, they had to be sinless. Or else they're boop, booted out. But here's the thing: uh, Scripture makes it makes it clear that we will be given the resurrected body, which is unable to sin, as First Corinthians 15 tells us. So, okay. So that's all he's saying there. Um, 318. You know, I, I do highly recommend this version of the NIV. It's the it's the 2011 print okay um, they were actually bought out by another company and they made it very readable and very easy to understand it's just a really good translation in my opinion dear children let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth <coughs> obviously talking about truly loving one person it's easy to say something but to really do something and show it is a lot different Oh, I love people. What about that person? Oh, they just have a problem with me, so you know what? They're just going to have to get over it. Well, that's not really loving them, is it? So 516 through 17. Um, you really, this is really kind of a, a whole passage that goes together, but I'll just focus on 16 and 17. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that, that does not lead to death. Okay, so a lot of different things being said here. First off, pray for believers who, who, are, who stumble, not who are living in sin. But a, 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 a Christian, you see a brother or sister, and they, and they mess up. What do you do? You pray for them. Now, he's not saying that your prayer will save them. He's saying that 
when, as you pray for them, God will hear your prayer and he will work. And once again, read the passages before and he will work in that person's life. Um, and then he says, I'm not saying you should pray about that. And later on he says, well, I'm not saying you should pray about that. What he's saying is don't, he's not necessarily saying don't pray. He's just saying I'm not addressing that. Okay, uh, that's not really what I'm talking about right now. Um, and obviously you wouldn't pray in the same way for that person as you would for this other person. You know, for this for the Christian who, who's messing up, you you know, you pray for them. But then for that person who's living in sin, um, John already said that, that that proves that they are not um, a Christian, regardless of whether they ever have been, they are at this point not a Christian. Um, as Christians don't live like that, the tests of life. Um, <clears throat> and so you'd have to pray differently. You'd have to pray for their salvation in that case. Um, or, you know, witness them or whatever. Um, so pray differently. But as Hebrews says, how can you lead somebody to repentance who is not being repented through Jesus, since Jesus is the only way to repentance? Um, so, believers don't live in sin, but and then he and then he goes on to say, all wrongdoing is sin, and there's no and and there is sin that does not lead to death. What he's saying here is, all sin is bad. All sin is bad. However, though it is different when a Christian lives in sin as when he as when he stumbles. Sometimes we see our brother or sister stumble, and we instantly hop down their throat. Obviously, being warned against. Saint John one seven says. Uh, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Now, keep in mind, this is how the Antichrists work. Right? Satan doesn't know when the end is. So there's an Antichrist we can figure at least one in every generation. Okay? Um, and But then there's a spirit of the Antichrist that's in the world, right? But then um, there are some people who act like an Antichrist because they have that spirit of the Antichrist. So um, I hope that that kind of clarifies that. But in Revelation specifies the, the, the actual the, the actual Antichrist, which only God knows who that will actually be. Um, but traditionally, it's been associated with so many different people. More recently, I think President Obama was the last one to be called uh, the Antichrist. Um, the Pope was at one time during the Reformation. I mean, we could go down the history. Um, Emperor Nero was considered to be by some. Etc. 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 What you understand is that there is not necessarily one person that he's talking about, just uh, kind of an attitude. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Um, and he's talking specifically here about those who are dividing the church. See, some people, me for instance, a couple months ago, uh, read this and said, okay, so there's anybody who has a false idea or a false doctrine, you shouldn't allow them in, in your home. No, he's talking about. There's these people, these false teachers who are getting to the church, and the Christians are having fellowship with them. And he's saying, well, don't do that. These people are, so I would say like this. If there is someone in your church who is causing problems, do not associate with them. You will get sucked in. You will be changed. The situation will go from bad to worse. I mean, so many different things. Um, I actually witnessed this firsthand um, happen um, in a church I was serving at. Third John John 1 8 says, We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. <sighs> My throat is just it's it's terrible. Um, you guys probably noticed not too many videos lately. My voice is just shot. Um those who uh, lose lose for the sake of the gospel, we should definitely provide for. See, some people take this to the extreme and say we should provide for everyone. We should give money to everyone. Well, that's just dumb. No, just no. Um, he's saying he's talking about uh, people who have lost things because because of the gospel. And we who have should should make sure that they still have somewhere to stay, some some clothes uh, for their backs, uh, uh, food for their mouth. I mean, we should obviously be taking care of each other. But we should also be partaking in charity, like, for instance, the refugee crisis. We should be doing something about that. Um, however, let's say, for instance, there's a beggar. I wouldn't necessarily give him food, per se, but give him what he needs, clothes, food, etc. Um, in fact, it's oftentimes bad practice to give money to people, especially in America, because you are just simply enabling them to do something stupid. Um, and obviously, you know, if somebody has a need, provide for the need. But money is is... is 
kind of a bad idea to give, especially because, you know, especially if they're an alcoholic, you're, just, you're not helping them. You're hurting them. Okay, you're not helping them to become more mature. You're becoming, helping them become less mature. So provide for the need. Okay, give, but not necessarily money. And be led by the Holy Spirit, but remember that, 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 that he doesn't say to just um, have no discernment in things. So I'm not really going to go any more on that because I really want get to get to Revelation, and James already talks about that. <clears throat> so it's important. Uh, but don't take it out of context. Some people give to everything. Some people give to nothing. There is a middle ground. Once again, balance. So the author, John, during his stay on the island of Patmos, excuse me, when he was exiled there, the audience uh, is pretty much Asia Minor, um, Western Turkey. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned Western Turkey earlier as associated with with um, First Peter. Um, it, not so much Western Turkey now that I think about it. Um, more of all of Turkey, <laughs> um, just kind of a very broad area. But this um, is is more specifically uh, the Western Turkey area. Um, and the date is around 96 Emperor Domitian's persecution. Um, the context. Um, an encouragement to Christians burdened by persecution and a delayed return of Christ. See, th these Christians are struggling with a lot of different things. They've got persecution, and they're wondering, where is God? So, you know, John writes if Revelations to the church to be an encouragement. How is it used today? Used to scare people. To get Used to get people saved. Used to, used to um, you know, in Sherlock Holmes, for instance, it was used to sound creepy. Um... These are all insufficient views. He's he's writing, he's writing for the purpose of, of of encouraging Christians. We should never forget that, drawing them back to God, drawing them to a purpose, helping them not to lose sight of what's going on. Um, so special characteristics: the number seven is often in the Book of Revelation. It is the number of completion in Revelation. Um, number twelve often appears um, to a symbolic of of God's people. Um, it is very dependent on apocalyptic literature, but it's very unique from other apocalyptic literature. Um, everything doesn't seem all gloomy. Um, there, there, there is a hope in it. You know, it's not so, uh, so negative. It's just a, a lot different. Um, the writer is an actual writer. Um, is the actual writer? I mean, um, just a lot of differences. Um, let me move this. Um, the elect lady that's mentioned, as mentioned also in, in one of the Johns, I think 2nd John, um, is God's people. Um, obviously, it was the Jews before, but then um, the Gentiles were grafted in, so it was more God's people as a whole. Um, um, keep in mind that we should definitely be, be combating... Um, and, and giving answers and, and combating false false ideas, and consider the the apologetical emphasis of the church from really the times of Paul, all the way through to like around 300s and so. Um, you know, they they definitely did see the need of, of answering the questions. We shouldn't have a view of you know, hey, just ignore the hard questions and accept it by faith. Like faith is some blind thing. Faith is trust in God, and it has a reason for why you trust in God. So, um, never forget that. Um, yeah. um, don't really want to get too much off topic, though. Um, in Revelations, it's best to take everything as um, symbolic rather than literal, um, unless John specifically um, mentions otherwise. Um, also, it's best to, 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 to not get worried over the details unless... John brings clarification. Like, for instance, he says, the lamb stand or everything. He says, oh, which is this? Well, okay, now we know. But, you know, some people, by randomly asserting it to this or that, have missed the whole point. Um, also, interpret it in its context and in its genre. Don't just take stuff out of context to prove points that you want to have. It's just uh, so many things that could be said with revelations. Um, Revelations is a very abused book. The main theme, God's control of the future. 
God is in control of the future. That's the main theme. Chapter 1 is an introduction, talks about more of the past. Um, uh, chapter 2 through 3 are the letters to the seven churches, talks about the present. Um, there are seven churches mentioned. Um, two, ha if I remember correctly, two have nothing good mentioned and two have nothing bad mentioned. Um, and then the other ones, you know, it's uh, three, the other three um, uh, are, have good and bad mentioned. Um, and, they're, and they're good for, for really comparing um, churches nowadays to um, really um, encapsulate all of, all of um, Christian uh, churches um, in a way. Um, chapters 4 through 5 um, talks about the heavenly praise. 6 through 19, um, once again, 4 through 5 seems like present. Uh, 6 to 19, um, future, but then 20 through 22 is like another tier of the future, I guess. It's just, they're kind of, they're kind of distinct. Um, the seven seals, the trumpets and the bowls, and then the millennium and the new heavens and earth in, in 2022. Um, so these are things, you can see the, the past, present, uh, immediate future, far distant future. Um, so, uh, don't, with revelations, don't lose sight of the forest for the trees, really. Um, some people get so stuck and caught up on, on the specific things that they completely miss the point. Remember, um, apocalyptic literature, you really have to read differently than you would like Paul's writings, for instance. Um, also, the order of events is very unclear. It could be chronological, it could be out of order. We really don't know. So don't get too caught up in trying to make a, a specific chronology of events like, for instance, John Hagee does. What's important is that we grasp the main main point of it, okay, of the, of the passage, and that we're able to, to, you know, do something with that. <laughs> um, also, it's best to just see revelations as not literal unless specified, as a general understanding. Um, also, don't get too wrapped up in one person's study who only does what, on the the revelation. John Hagee, once again, one great, you know, I'm sure he's a great great guy. I've never personally met him. I've heard him speak a couple times. But remember, he's not God. He doesn't have absolute knowledge. He has his theory, okay? And then there's other people who have their theories, okay? And they have good things to say, of course. But keep in mind that nobody has full understanding of Revelations. Maybe John didn't even, you know. Um, so ne ne don't don't lose the sight of the, of the forest for the trees. You know, don't get so caught on the specifics that you just miss the whole point. Okay. Um, I think I've said enough of that. So let's go through some things. One five, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, Joe's witness claimed that this means that Jesus was the first created. Well, in context, that's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about the first in resurrection. Jesus was the first to be resurrected. I mean, it's not that difficult of a concept. Um, 120. Nevertheless, I have this against... I'm sorry, that's 220. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and, in the, and, and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. See how he clarified for, for the audience? That means that that is what that means. But there's some parts where he doesn't, and so it's very important that we don't say, so this is that. Well, no, not necessarily. Calm down with that. I know, for instance, some people who have, who have now put America into the, call, into the context. Unlikely seems how America was even a thing back then. So, you know, uh, once again, um, what did it mean to them then and there? Hermeneutics, that's, a, that's a, Hermeneutics 101. Always understand what it meant to the audience before you start uh, saying what it meant means now. So, um, it's, it, there, was a, there was a theory at the time that there, was, there were angels that watched over the churches. You can see this even in Paul's teachings when he says, um, for the sake of the angels. He's talking about for the sake of the, the angels who are watching over the church. Um, so it seems like that's what he's talking about in 120. Um, and actually, that kind of seems to repeat in Revelations. You've got the angels over the over the sections of the earth, um, and it seems like you know maybe kind of not the idea of a guardian angel per se, but um, the idea of angels in those places. Um, so uh, don't want to get too off topic here. Um, Eight twelve.
The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. Um, he's not literally, he's not necessarily being literal. Okay, let me just, let me just say that. He's not necessarily being literal. He may be literal. But, I mean, imagine the sun, and then, you know, I guess like that or something. Yeah, it just, meh, maybe, but once again, with apocalyptic literature, you don't really take everything as literal. You, it usually has deep symbolism and that kind of stuff. Um, so imagery, not necessarily literal. 11.3. Um, um, and I will, and I'm not trying to, I'm trying to make it out as though Revelations is not inspired. I'm trying to help you guys see that your opinion of Revelations is not inspired. Okay, what study does is it shows the bias in our understanding and the way that we are wrong. Creations thought that the sun was the center of the universe. I'm sorry, the Earth was the was the center. The sun was spinning around it. Then, with the theory of heliocentrism, um, it was shown that the sun was. Well, see what I mean? Um, uh, it changed how we understood the Bible. So, eleven three, and I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. Um, one thousand two hundred sixty days. That's three and a half years. It seems like obviously what he's saying is half of seven. God isn't finished yet. That seems like what he's saying. Once again, also it's not necessarily to actual physical literal people who come could be but it could also not be um, we need to be sure that once again don't overlook this the point for the for the specifics okay so there's going to be you know this witnessing that's going on and it's going to happen happen for for a good length of time but then it's going to be halted and god's not done yet see that's i mean goodness sakes in chapter 12 it talks about the woman and the dragon. Um, the dragon is obviously Satan, and the woman is obviously, um, well, probably by by their by the views of the time, the woman is probably um, the Jews, and then Christ, who was born, um, well, then was snatched up to heaven, and so that now the dragon's fighting because you know he's ticked off. Um, so Christ's victory is why the church is persecuted by Satan, because Christ is victorious. Satan seeks all the more to destroy the church. Um, so in other words, he's saying, you know, hey, keep, keep it up. Christ has already run, already won. Don't give up. 13, 17. Once again, please don't miss the main point of Revelations. So that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, before we get on to the to the um, and all that stuff, it's important to note that there is strong demonic influence in the economy and in all these different things w w with trade and whatnot. Once again, the level, level of literalness we'll know when we get there, but for the meantime, what we do know um, is that there will be demonic influence over over world um, over world um, uh, the world's economies and different things like that. Not necessarily that the world will become one unified um, government. It's possible, but not necessarily. It's not it's not necessarily going to happen in the way that we think. And why I emphasize this is because Jesus came once, and the Jews were certain he was coming this way, and then he didn't come that way. And it was completely what they were not expecting. And it's the exact same thing nowadays. Jesus is coming again, and it's important that we don't keep looking out in the desert for something that may or may not happen. We'll know how it happens when it comes. For the meantime, we should be alert, and we should take courage because Christ is one, and we should realize that God's in control and all these different things, and that there is a future for us. Okay, so, um, with that being said, um, this is not necessarily a literal mark. Like, for instance, some people said it was, it's going to be a microchip, maybe, very possible. Um, some people have said that it is going to be like a tattoo or something like that. Well, I, you know, I guess that's possible. Some people said it's kind of like a credit card. You know, some people said this, some people said that. You know, it, it just, uh, it could be, could, by all means, it could be. But I think the Hollywood movies, like there was one called Mark, I think is what it called, something like that, and there was one called um, oh, the Left Behind movies. 
keep in mind that you know fiction is fiction. This is what the Bible actually says, so we need to be careful there. Um, also, in 13, 18, it says this calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast for the number of a man. That man, that number is 666. Uh, the number, uh, yeah. Um, or is humanity's number. <sighs> okay. There's a few things. What is the symbolism of 666? Well, 7 in the book of Revelations becomes wholeness, the sign of wholeness. God's Not, not necessarily God's number, but, but the sign of, of perfection and completeness. So 777 being... Uh, symbolic of God, you know, but then Satan always tries to mirror God's thing, but always falls short. So six, six, six. Uh, some people have said that there's certain like gematria or whatever the heck it's called, where where the numbers mean something, except that Revelations was written in Greek and not in Hebrew or Aramaic. So there's that. Um, also, the audience was not Hebrew; they were Greek. So, or I should say pagan. They were not Jewish, they were pagan. So there's that too. Um, and they would have completely missed the point of the book. Once again, we can bet that John wrote things um, for the congregation of the day, although obviously he pro he, there's a good chance he probably didn't understand everything. It's a good thing and chance that the church didn't understand everything, but that doesn't mean that he didn't write it for those people. So anyways, um... We shouldn't, um, if people have said, um, you know, hey, it was Emperor Nero. It's a different spelling of, of Nero than than um, his traditional spelling. It's actually a wrong spelling of it. Um, not really a wrong one, but, well, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, or it's this or that. Just be careful with that. Just be careful with that. The main point is that Satan falls short of God. It may mirror God. He may be able to conjure up worship from people, but he will always fall short. Think of how the, how the battle at the end is going to happen. He, Jesus is going to win without any actual battle. He's going to come and wipe out the enemy. Problem solved. There's not going to be how we think of it, you know, where Satan's pinned in over here and Jesus is pinned in and they're in the trenches, you know, and it's not going to be like that. Um, so 14.4. Remember that there was an imperial cult where you had to call emperor, uh, uh, Christ, savior, and lord. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. Um, obviously, he's talking about people who remained pure and people who didn't remain pure, as is the old, way the Old Testament mentions it. Um, not necessarily people who have not had sex. Um, so people remain pure to God. Um, Fourteen, twelve. I mean, there's people who get weird with this. There's some people. I know, I know of a man who isn't even registered with the system. Like I don't even know how that's a possibility. But like social security, he doesn't have a social security number. He, I don't even think he has has a um, a driver's license. He bikes everywhere. I mean, like. I don't know how he's been able to pull that off, but I mean, once again, going a little bit farther necessary than uh, what's clearly being said. Um, so, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keeps his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. So basically, we're saying is yes, things are going to get bad, but be patient. Be patient. Um, sixteen, sixteen. Then they gathered the kings together to a place that, that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Once again, not necessarily the actual literal place. Could be the actual literal place, but um, yeah, just be careful about that. 22.2. Um, um, you know, and there's some people nowadays who, who take like the, the, the Jewish rabbis and stuff that came after Jesus and, you know, quote them like, oh, the Jews really have things figured out. The Jews aren't saved, first off. The, the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. Um, and then second off, um, they came after Jesus, not before him. And we need to remember that. Um, and then not only that, but the, the other rabbis that they quote that weren't after Jesus, the ones that were before Jesus, um, is they, they were after Malachi, who was the last prophet. Okay. So, once again, not inspired, and we do need to remember that. 
Oh, well, there's this Jewish tradition, yes, but just because it's tradition in the Jewish eyes does not mean that it's actual fact in Christian's eyes. Goodness sakes. Have a little bit more discretion than that. 22 2, down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And then in 5, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Once again, the resolution of evil. Finally, the what about the problem of evil? It has been set right. The healing of the nations. The the um the problem of evil is no longer real. In in, in the sense, Revelations is kind of like anti-Genesis, um, whereas Genesis everything had a beginning and we saw sin take its root. In Revelation, everything has found its conclusion. Sin is no longer a factor, and Christ is absolutely one. Whereas man and Satan screwed everything up, and and Genesis and Revelations, Christ set everything right. Just complete the anti-Genesis. Um, any questions? Uh, please post them below. And remember, please be aware of, of people with the end times thing. People, who, First off, people who study the end times alone, that's unhealthy. That really is. The Bible has a lot more to say than just the end times. Okay, But then more so than that, um, you know, <sighs> listening to televangelists as though they are the final authority is never a good idea. Listening to Jewish commentators as though they are the final authority is never a good idea.